I don't know if there's a better setup than that as I jump in this morning. If I do not know you and have not had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Tim and I'm the executive pastor of The Journey. And as you just heard from Pastor Curtis, we are in a three-week sermon series where we are looking at the the mission statement of our church, but even beyond that, uh, who God is calling all of us to be as individuals as we seek to live this out in our lives. And so if you're not familiar with our mission statement, if you're new to The Journey or you have not gotten a tattoo to your forearm yet, uh, let me just remind you of really what we aspire to become uh, as a church, that we say as a journey uh, that we are a diverse community uh, centered on Jesus Christ that is seeking to wholly enjoy his grace, faithfully embody his love to one another, and boldly engage our culture with his truth from our neighborhoods to the nations. And so what we're doing in the sermon series each week is looking at what does it mean to enjoy grace? What does it mean to embody love? What does it mean to engage culture? And so as you just heard from Pastor Curtis, what I'm going to be doing this morning is talking about what it means to embody love, what it means to actually live this out in our lives and to live this out as a church. And just to give you a little bit of a window into my heart, a little bit of context of who I am, uh, when I graduated from college and when I started entering into young adulthood, Uh, My friends uh, started giving me this nickname called the Heisman. And I'm just going to bury the lead and tell you that I was not called the Heisman because I'm a good football player. Uh, I didn't play football. I'm not good at football. The Lord did not make my body for football. I'm the guy that if I got hit, I'm not getting back up. (laughs) The reason why they called me the Heisman was because of who I was in relationship, who I was in friendship with other people. Uh, Because what I would do in friendship was say, I want to be close, I want to be known, I want to live in vulnerability with you, but don't get too close. Don't allow it to be too vulnerable. And and the closer people got and and the more risky it felt to me, what I would do is I would begin to push them away, a la the Heisman, the stiff arm. And so what I would do is say on one level, yes, I want to be in friendship, but I don't want to be in that type of friendship. Yes, I want to experience love, but I don't know if I want that much love. And I share that this morning because I would love to say that that's who I used to be. Like I'd love to say that I I was that, but I've grown out of it. But even today, that tends to be what I still do. And I share that because I don't think I'm alone. I think that many of us, if not all of us, would say, yes, I want to be loved. Yes, I want to be known. Yes, I want to have friendship. But it's hard, and it's difficult, and it feels risky, and there's vulnerability, and and we don't know what happens when we invite people into that type of relationship in our lives. And here's the truth. Every single person, every single worldview that we have would uphold love as a value. So, So everybody desires it. Everybody values it. But the question is this. What is distinct about who Jesus is, and about who Jesus has called us to be when it comes to embodying love. And so what I want to do this morning is is very simply two things. I want to answer two questions. One, what does it mean to embody love? What does it mean? But beyond that, how do we actually live this out in our lives? How do we actually embody love to one another as a church? And, And then how do we actually do that beyond the church to do that in the lives of other people? And so if you look at your text, I think our text is going to really answer this question of what it means to embody love. And we're going to be in this text all three weeks in this sermon series. So this is the second time that we've lived in this. And the first thing that we're going to see in this text when it comes to how do we embody love is what we see is that God calls us into a shared identity with one another because of Jesus. That if you understand who Jesus is, if you understand what he's done, then what you get is that he actually calls us to one another. What do I mean? We'll start in verse 9, and let's look at this together. Here's Peter's words to his people. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are people for his own possession. What Peter's doing in the middle of this chapter is he's giving the the people of God, followers of God, titles to remind them who they are. And what he's doing in this moment is he's trying to explain to them what makes them distinct. And interestingly, what Peter's doing is he's not telling them what to do, instead he's telling them who they are. And what he says is this, that if you understand who God is, who Jesus, what Jesus has done for you, then what you understand is that because of Jesus, you've been set apart. You, you've been set apart because of the holiness of God, and you've been set apart because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. And it's easy if you look at this at the beginning to say, well, when I read these titles, this feels a little arrogant. This feels a little elitist. 
So, so what is actually Peter telling us about being distinct? What is Peter telling us about being set apart? Well, we got to understand the context of 1 Peter. Because if you understand the audience, then you really understand what Peter's saying. His audience, if you go back to 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, is a group of people who, are, we're told, are in exile. That they are marginalized. That they are vulnerable. That they have been persecuted. And so what Peter's not doing is this. He's not saying that because of God, you're better than everyone. He's also not trying to puff them up and give them a false sense of confidence that is separated from their current reality. Instead, what he's saying is this. Despite your circumstances, despite the persecution, despite the ways that you've been made to be marginalized, remember who you are. Remember who God is and remember what God has called you into. Because if you understand who God is and what God's called you into, then what you understand is this, that you were called to a people and you were called for a people. That when Jesus saved you, yes, he saved you to God, but he also saved you to followers of God. That you're actually called into a community. So whatever your circumstances are, no matter how bad it seems, you are not alone. And in this moment, what he's trying to explain to these people is this. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget what God has done. Don't forget what God has covenanted to you. And don't forget who God has covenanted you to. Because oftentimes what we feel when we are struggling is we can automatically go into isolation and believe that we are the only people who are doing it. But what he's trying to explain is that because of Jesus, yes, you've been given an individual identity and who Jesus claims you to be, but your individual identity is always tethered to a corporate identity. That you are called to a group of people as you are called to the Lord. And here's why this matters for us. Because we don't understand this. Like, in our Western culture and in our English language, this is oftentimes not the way that we interpret Scripture and we understand the commanding or the commands and the calling of God. See, for many of us, when we read the Bible, we oftentimes read it through a very individualistic lens. It's about my church experience. It's about my personal holiness. It's about my relationship with God. But here's the thing you've got to understand about Scripture and even the original language of Scripture. Even in verse 9 when it says, but you, that you is not an individual you. That, that you is a you all. That, it's a plural you to say, you all are these things. You all are called to these things. So what he's saying is that you don't have the right to live as an individual if you put your hope and your trust in God. You have been called to a people, but do you know that? Do you understand that you share an identity beyond yourself with the followers of God? That, that your spirituality is not just individualistic, it is corporate. So the question is, if we're called to a people, then, then what does that mean in terms of the way that we do relationships? What does that mean in terms of how we actually enter into relationship with one another? Well, Peter goes on, and he says this, that if you understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, then what you understand is that Jesus levels the spiritual playing field. He levels the spiritual playing field. Well, that sounds cute. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Look at verse 10. He says, once you were not a people... But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here's what Peter's trying to explain to them. He's trying to explain who they are apart from God and who they are because of Jesus. Who they are apart from God, but who they are because of Jesus. And what he's saying is this. Apart from God, you are sinful, you are rebellious, you are enemies. But because of Jesus, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are able to receive access to his grace. And what he's saying is that if you understand the implications of Jesus and what he's done, then what you understand is this, that all fall short, that all are sinful, yet that all have access to his grace and can receive his grace and can walk in his grace. That there's not one of us who can do it on our own. It's only by the blood and the grace and the mercy of Jesus that we can be saved. And so what he's trying to say is this, is that all of you apart from God fall short, and all of you, because of God, can have access to him. And when you understand the implications of that, and when you understand the reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, it dismantles the spiritual hierarchies that exist with us. That we no longer look at each other and say, I'm better than you. Or look, look at how much more God loves me than he loves this group of people. No, what you realize is that Jesus humbles us, and then Jesus elevates us because of who he is and because of what he's done. He levels our spiritual playing field. Here's a way to think about this. 
I've told you about this before, but in my previous life, before I did pastoral ministry, when I was in college, I was a guide and I took out backpacking trips with high school students. And I've told you all the nasty, disgusting things about that, but there was some really good redeeming things about it as well. And one of the things that I loved about going on these trips, especially with high school students, was many of these kids had never been in the mountains before. And because they'd never been in the mountains before, they were all out of their comfort zone. And there's something very unique about watching high school students out of their comfort zone. And one of the most unique things was to see how the social categories began to interplay with one another. Uh, some of you were in high school. Some of you might be able to remember high school. But if, if you remember high school, one of the things that is true of every high school is that students would divide themselves by these very broad social categories. So you have your popular kids and you have your athletes, and you have your nerds, and you have your druggies, and you have your theater kids, and fill in the blank for what it looked like in your high school. You get the point. And what would happen is, whatever the broad social categories were, uh, no one would ever mingle or mix with one another because it could be uh, ca a catastrophe for your social life. But here's what would happen when kids would go on the mountain. None of it mattered. And you know why none of it mattered? Because none of them knew what they were doing and they were all out of their comfort zone, and they all knew that they needed something outside of themselves to help them, that they needed something outside of themselves to tell them where they needed to go and how they needed to get there. And so what was fascinating for me was to see how quickly those social categories were dismantled, how the very thing that had divided them minutes and moments before didn't matter anymore. And all of a sudden, all the, the only thing that mattered was that they needed each other, they had to survive, and they had to get there together. And in the same way that that can happen socially on a mountain is the same way that spiritually it happens for us when we understand who Jesus is. That when we understand who Jesus is and what he's done, it dismantles the way that we look at each other. And what it means is that if you are in Christ, there's no room for condemnation. That there's no room for judgment. That there's no room to look at people who sin differently than you and to say, I'm better than you. But it's also okay to not look at other people and say, well, they're better than me because all of us fall short. And yet all of us have access to his grace. And so what's compelling is what we share in is we share in our need for Jesus together. But Peter takes it a step further. Because what Peter's going to show us is we are not called just to embody love for the sake of embodying love. Uh, we're not just called to love one another because it's the right thing to do or a good thing to do. What Peter's going to show us is what is distinct about godly love. If you go back to your Bibles and you look again at verse 9, again, Peter says this, but you are a chosen race, that you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, you are a people for his own possession. Why? Why are you those things? Read the rest of verse 9. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who calls you out of darkness into marvelous light. What Peter is saying is this. You're not, called for the, you're not called to love for the sake of loving. Ultimately, the purpose of embodying love to one another is to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. The reason why we're called to love is not so that people can just feel good, although we desire that to be true, but that as we seek to be in relationship and as we seek to love one another, ultimately we're pointing to a greater love and to proclaim the name of Jesus and his love for each other. And so here's what this means. That has an internal and external application. Internally, here's what it means. We are actually called to be in community with one another. Like we are actually called to be in real relationships with one another. That we are called to become a people that move beyond just seeing our place in the church as when we show up on a Sunday morning and then we leave. Because here's the truth. God actually designed some of the very people that are sitting around you to actually enter into your life, to love you and to serve you. Why? To proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. That our reason for coming to church is not just to hear a guy preach, to sing a few songs, and to walk out of the door. But instead, the reason that we're called to be a church is to see the gifts and the positions that God has given us to serve the needs of one another. Why? To proclaim his excellencies. And here's the problem. If you don't understand that, then you are depriving us and you are depriving yourself of what God wants to do in this church. Because here's the truth. Uh, if you see your role only as coming and going from this building, then what you're doing is you are depriving yourself of the ways that God wants to use people to enter into your life, to help you grow, to help you 
healed to help you learn, to help you proclaim the excellencies of Jesus in ways that you can't do for yourself. But here's the other side of that coin. You're also depriving us. Because whether you know it or not, we need you to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus in our life. That, that God may have distinctly and uniquely made you in a way that actually as you serve the needs of one another, that God could use you to proclaim the excellencies in the life of somebody else. And so what we see is that God actually calls us into love to proclaim his excellencies. But, but that also has an external impact. And here's the external impact. We are not called to love one another at the exclusion of other people being able to enter into that. See, God doesn't call us into a self-fulfilling love. He doesn't say that I want followers of God just to love one another in a very inward-facing way at the cost of actually being welcoming to those who also want to enter into that community, both in our churches and in our homes. And the opportunity that we have is as we become a people who learn to love one another, here's what it does. We actually begin to mirror the very gospel that we believe. And so what people begin to see as they walk through these doors and they enter into your life is this, that because of Jesus, we do relationships differently. Because of Jesus, uh, we handle sin differently, we handle disagreement differently, we handle gifting differently, we handle the way that we enter into each other's relationships differently because we believe that we have a greater hope and a greater savior. And so what that means for us is we have to see the value that God did not call us just to love each other at the exclusion of others, but as we proclaim the excellencies of Jesus in our lives to one another, we then live that out to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus in the lives of other people outside of here. God did not call us to be an inward-facing church at the exclusion of the outward calling that he's given in our lives. And so this is our purpose, that as we love one another, we proclaim his excellencies. Let me just stop for a second. And here's why I want to stop. Because this sounds pretty good, right? Like if we did this as a church, we would say, hey, we feel pretty good about that. But here's the problem. This isn't oftentimes the way that people experience churches. This is not the way that oftentimes people would describe churches. This is maybe even in some ways not the way that you would describe this church. See, for most people, when they look at Christians, this is not the way that they would describe Christians. For most people, when they look at Christians outside of the church, what they oftentimes would say is this, that Christians are hypocrites, that they're condemning, that they're judgmental. Not, man, I see them love well, and I see them live in humility, and I see them proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. And here's why this is a problem. I think for many of us, we don't have a problem understanding the call to love. We get that. I think that there's probably, for many of you, not much that I'm saying that isn't new. Our problem isn't that we don't know what it means to love. Our problem is we don't know how to love. We struggle to know how to actually do this, how to actually embody love in the way that God's called us. So here's what I want to do very briefly for the rest of the sermon. I actually want to walk out some very specific practical ways that I think God is calling us to embody love. And as we seek to embody love, what it looks like to actually live out the very purpose and the very identity that Peter is talking about in chapter 2. So how do we embody love? Well, the first way we embody love is this. We value each other's differences. We value each other's differences. Here's what I mean. God has called us to a shared identity. But here's the other thing that's true about God. God has uniquely and distinctly made each one of us. If you, if you go to 1 Corinthians, one of the things that Paul writes about is that the church is one body that has many different parts. And so one of the things that's true about having many different parts is this, that every single one of us is different, and yet in our differences, it's a way for us to experience a fuller expression of God, if we value each other's differences. See, we live in a world and we live in a time where differences oftentimes lead to division. But to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus actually allows us to see our differences can point us to a greater understanding of him if we allow ourselves. So here's what that means as a church. We see differences as good. We don't try to uphold one idea of how we experience God at the cost of every other idea of how we experience God. That what we say as a church is this, that we are a diverse community that is centered on Jesus. And so what that means is that we will always be a church that is centered on Jesus. We will always proclaim the good news of Jesus, but we will also uphold the different ways that God has created us. And so what that means uniquely for this church is this. We will live in unlikely relationships and friendships with one another. 
that we can actually do relationship differently because of the proclamation of Jesus, that we can actually be a church where there's young and old, where there's rich and poor, where there's single and married, where there's hipsters and housewives, that there's police officers and protesters, where there's multiple ethnicities and races and cultural backgrounds that can be the fullest expression of who God's called us to be. And we don't do that at the exclusion of other people. We actually see that it's a benefit for us more fully experiencing God. So here's what that means for us. It means we value differences. It means we repent when we don't uphold differences. And it means that we are a church that seeks equity in our differences so that everyone has a seat at the table. Men and women, rich and poor, black and white, young and old. Why? So that we can experience a fuller expression of God. And so here's what that practically means for us. When you come to this church, you will experience differences in the way that we do worship. Let me walk it out. When you come to this church, here's what it means. We will have hymns and we will have gospel music. We will have liturgical dance. What it also means is that there will be people who yell and clap and say amen. 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 <laughs> and it also means that there's people who are going to take notes. It means that you're going to be at a church where there's a black guy preaching, an Asian guy preaching, and a white guy preaching. And rather than being people who say, well, that's their thing, or that's my thing, or that's my preference, or that's their preference, we see we need all of it to better experience a fuller view of who God is and who God calls us to be. That there's not a right way or a wrong way when we are people who are centered on Jesus, because that's the only way. And so let me take it a step further. Here's what it means. Curtis Gilbert, Tim Holly, John Chung are very different preachers. You know that? You know it. <laughs> and in our differences, whether it's differences in style or emotion or tone or, or the things that we uphold in Scripture because of our cultural background, can I just tell you that we all share the same Holy Spirit? Can I just tell you that no matter what the style is or what it sounds like or whether it's too loud or not loud enough or too emotional or not emotional enough, we share the same Holy Spirit? And because of that, we can be a church that values the unique and distinct ways that God has gifted us and not say, well, I don't prefer that or I would rather have that, to say, no, I need all of that, whether it is my style or not, whether it is my cultural preference or not, because what we see is those cultural preferences get eliminated when we value differences and we're centered on Jesus. But here's what it also means. It doesn't just mean who we are when we gather on a weekend service. It's also the very reason why we do community the way that we do. If you're part of a community group here, one of the things that we do in our community groups is we do not have community groups uh, that are based on life stage, circumstance, or even age. Instead, we have multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-gifting within our community groups. And the reason why we have community groups that way is because we believe that through our differences, we can actually grow and experience God better together than we can separate. That we actually believe that when you're in community with people who are older than you or younger than you or different than you, that it actually can allow you to experience more of who God is. As you sit and as you discuss and as you sit in God's word and as you hear about other people's life experiences. And so we can't run away from that. Instead, we have to enter into that and we have to value it. So God calls us to be a people who value differences. But God also calls us as a people as we enter into community, to be people who live vulnerably. He calls us to be people who live vulnerably. How, how do I actually truly proclaim the excellencies of Jesus in somebody's life? Well, you have to know them. And see, what God calls us in our vulnerability is to actually be in real relationship where people can be known and people can be loved, where you can be known and where you can be loved. But here's the problem for many of us. For many of us, we like to live on the surface. For many of us, we are terrified to move beyond talking about circumstances of our, of our lives, who we actually are. And, and here's what's true about me. Uh, you can sit and have a conversation with me about my family, uh, about the weather, about the cardinals, about my job, and I could talk to you all day. But you start pressing in on that, and, and you ask me about what I'm struggling with, areas of sin in my life, uh, where I'm seeking to grow, how, how I'm insecure, where I'm failing my wife, where I'm failing my kids, I now want to take a step back because it's so uncomfortable, because it's so difficult to move beyond the surface. 
And whether you're a man or a woman in here, it's a challenge for us to actually intentionally enter into vulnerability because vulnerability is scary. I will tell you that as a pastor, vulnerability is one of the most terrifying things in the world to me. And the reason why it's terrifying is because I believe that you all have an expectation of who I should be, and that's good, that's not wrong, but I have an expectation of myself of who I think you think I should be. I have a certain image that I want to project of how I want to be seen, of how I want to be known, of how I want people to think about me. And if I allow that to become the thing that I uphold, then I will always run away from vulnerability. But here's the truth. That's not just an issue with pastors. That's an issue with every single one of us that's here. That all of us have an expectation for how we want to be seen, for how we want to be known, for how we want people to think about us. And if we're not careful, that is the thing that we uphold at the cost of actually being people who are known and people who are loved. Why? So that people can proclaim the excellencies of Jesus in our life. I remember several years ago, different job that I had. Uh, after I graduated from college, I uh, went into education and I started coaching basketball. And ironically, I went back to my old high school uh, to teach and coach, the high school that I attended and grew up in. And when I was in high school, uh, I played basketball and I was decent at basketball. Uh, But here's what happened. Uh, The longer I was gone, uh, the more the story grew. Has that ever happened to you? Right? Like, you know what I'm getting at, right? Like, the longer you're gone from something, uh, the more people start elevating you uh, to a point that may or may not be true. So by the time I had gone back to my high school, uh, the players that I coached had an expectation of who they thought I was as a basketball player. One day, we don't have enough guys on on the team to play, so I said, hey, coach, come out and scrimmage with us. I thought, I'll give it a try. We'll see how this goes. I'll see if I still have it. And I'll just tell you that I was not in good shape. I certainly was not in high school shape uh, to run up and down a basketball court. And I had not picked up a basketball in a really long time. And as I started playing, I was awful. I mean, I was embarrassingly terrible. And I knew it, and I could barely even breathe running up and down the court. I was trying to figure out what happened. It wasn't that long ago. And, And as I got done... I went over to the side, and the best player on our team came up to me. And he said, hey, coach, I heard you were really good at basketball. I guess that wasn't actually true. And I will tell you, one, I was like, how dare you? You are not allowed to say that to me. But two, I mean, that was like the shot to my identity. That was just the dagger in my heart. But here's the problem. He wasn't wrong. I was not good. But here's the other problem. Even if I was in good shape, and even if I had been playing basketball, I was never going to be who he thought I was. I was always going to live below his expectation because who he thought I was wasn't actually who I was. And in so many ways, when it comes to us living our lives, who people think we are isn't who we really are. That we are so focused on projecting an image of how we want people to see us at the cost of actually inviting people in. And here's what I know. Uh, There are many of you that are struggling in deep sin. You're struggling with addiction, you're struggling with insecurity, you're struggling with depression, you're struggling with anxiety, your marriage is on the ropes. And rather than getting help, and rather than inviting people in, and rather than trusting that God may use other people in your life to actually be a part of your healing and to be people who could walk alongside you, you've been more focused on trying to maintain an image of who you want to be seen as versus actually getting the help that you need. And you've allowed an expectation of how you want to be seen by others to impact who you actually are. See, here's the thing about being vulnerable. Being vulnerable requires two things. It requires being open, but also being needy. It requires us telling people, here's who I actually am and I want to invite you in, and then also saying, I have no idea what to do. And for many of us, when we get to that place in our community groups or when we're with our friends, what we oftentimes do is we substitute substitute vulnerability for partial truth. And so what we do is we say, I'm going to tell you enough of who I am so that you can enter in and believe that I'm being open with you, but I'm never going to tell you who I fully am to get the help that I need. And yet to be a people who embody love is to be a people who live vulnerably. It's to be a people who actually trust others enough with your life to actually invite them in. Why? So you can actually experience the love of Jesus. Because here's the truth. If you understand the love of Jesus, then you have nothing to hide. That, That you can actually live exposed. Because here's what you know. Because of Jesus, you've already been unconditionally loved. Because of Jesus, you've already been forgiven. Because of Jesus, you've already been declared his own. 
And so because of Jesus, it should actually cause us to live lives where we're more open, where we're more exposed, because we don't have to live in shame for who we are. But we have to get help to grow in him. And let me be very careful, and let me be very clear. When I talk about vulnerability, I talk about vulnerability with boundaries. You don't need to share all of who you are with every person in your life. But you should have a couple people in your life, people that you trust, people that you know are going to love you, people who are not going to use what you share with them against you, that you can actually open up. That men, you should have other men in your life that are speaking into who you are. Women, you should have other women in your life that are speaking into who you are. But here's the truth. In order for us to be vulnerable people, we actually have to create environments for vulnerability to exist. Like we actually have to be people who create safety in the way that we do relationships, safety in the way that we allow people to be vulnerable so that they can actually be vulnerable. And so here's part of being vulnerable. It's being people who are empathetic. It's actually being people who can empathize as people are struggling, can enter in with them and can seek to embody love to them. Uh, Brene Brown, who is a very famous writer, and she writes a lot on emotional intelligence and emotional health, says this about empathy that empathy is feeling with people, that empathy is feeling with people. And she goes on to say this, that what empathy looks like is this. When a person is struggling, they are living in a figurative cave. And while they're sitting in that cave, uh, what is oftentimes happening for them is they are feeling overwhelmed, they are feeling anxious, they are feeling scared, they are feeling angry. And what an empathetic person does is this, they get in the cave with that person. They actually come down to that person And as they are with that person, they say, I know how you feel, and you're not alone. I know how you feel, and you're not alone. And and I'll take it a step further, because I think who God calls us to be as people is this. It's also sometimes okay to be people who say, I don't know how you feel, but you're also not alone. And so what it means to be people of God who actually embody love and seek to serve one another is to not be people who try to fix each other. It's to not be people who try to put the silver lining on it. It's not to be people that I'm just going to grenade you with Bible verses until you can bring some hope, you can find some hope and experience some truth. No, it's to be people who say, I'm going to love you in the way that Jesus loves you, by pursuing you, by being present with you, and by unconditionally loving you. That's what it means to embody love. That's what it means to live vulnerably. And here's what happens as you invite people in, it actually leads to growth where you can actually experience healing and growth in areas that you need to. So we have to be people who are vulnerable. Here's the last thing. We also have to be people who seek to love without an exit strategy. We have to be people who seek to love without an exit strategy. Now, I would love to say that I coined this term, but I stole it from another guy who stole it from another guy. Uh, This actually comes from a book by a guy named uh, Paul Miller. But here's what I would say to us. We cannot be people who embody love until we have actually experienced the love of Jesus. Like, you will never embody love until you actually experience Jesus' love. How did Jesus love? How does Jesus love us? Well, here's the way that Jesus loves us. He loves us unconditionally, and he loves us sacrificially. That the only way that you can actually embody love to people is when you experience the love that Jesus has given to you unconditionally and sacrificially. And here's the truth about Jesus' love. Jesus' love is not a conditional love. Jesus' love is not a love that says, I will only love you if. I will only love you if you become this. I will only love you if you do this. I will only love you if you make me feel this way. Instead, Jesus' love is a Romans 5.8 love. Do you know Romans 5.8? Here's what a Romans 5.8 love is. It's while we were still sinners, Christ died. Some translations say it this way. While we were still enemies, Christ died. And so what that means is when we look at the love of Jesus, here's what we know to believe true. Jesus' love was not conditional or contingent. Instead, his love was this. I know where you're broken. I know you're in need. I know how you're sinful. I know that you're my enemy, and I'm coming for you. I am coming down for you. I'm going to live a life that you cannot live, and I'm going to die a death that you deserve. But as I do that, what I'm going to do is demonstrate that I have unconditionally loved you, not because of what you can do for me, but because I love you and I've come down on your behalf. And so what that means is this. When we understand that type of love, what we get is that Jesus didn't just call us to love. Jesus called us to embody love. And what that means is Jesus called us to love in a way where we don't take it on or off. Jesus didn't call us to love in a way where it's convenient. 
or when we're around the right people, or we're not too busy, or when we're only in our work. No, Jesus said, you're called to embody love in all of who you are, in all of who you live, in all relationships that you have. Why? Because that's the way that Jesus loved us. That Jesus loved us without a nexus strategy, and therefore we are called to love without a nexus strategy. And so here's what it means. It means to love people requires a lot because it required everything for him. Uh, To love people actually means that it takes time. It means that you actually have to sacrifice. It means that you can't look at people with an agenda, but you just have to love people for who they are. It means to love knowing that that love is not always going to be reciprocated. It's to love knowing that sometimes God's call for you is to love people who are difficult. It's to love people who are your enemies. And yet that is the very way that Jesus has loved you. And so to embody love is to be people who say, I see who you are, I see where you are, I see what you're going through, and I'm not leaving. I'm going to sacrifice on your behalf, and I'm going to love you unconditionally because this is the very thing that Jesus has done for me. And here's what happens. When we learn to love this way, there's two things that take place. The first one is this, that every single day as we seek to love people in that way, we are reminded of Jesus' love for us. You want to be reminded of Jesus' love? Go love difficult people. Go love difficult people. You want to be reminded of Jesus' grace? Go be in a relationship with difficult people. Because here's what happens for me, that as I love people that are difficult, and as I enter into relationship with people that are difficult, I am reminded that that's who I am. But yet, Jesus still chose to love me. Jesus still chose to give me his grace. And so as I seek to love people, it is a reminder regularly of my need for Jesus and of his love for me. But here's the other reason why we're called to love in this way. Because at the end of the day, God did not call us to be one another's functional saviors. That at the end of the day, our hope is not to point people to us as their need, but to point uh, them to him as their need. That at the end of the day, what we are called to do is not to say, look at how great I am, but look at how great he is. That there are times where I will fail you. There are times that I will let you down. There are times where I will not love you enough, but guess what? There is one who will. And he is greater, and he has already loved you, and he has already come down for you, and he has already died for you, and he has already fully given it for you on, your, on his behalf for you. And so part of our calling is this. We're not called to give people ourselves. We're called to give people him. Through the way that we care for them, through the way that we serve them, through the way that we love them, through the way that we are present and continue to walk alongside them. To say there is a greater hope and there's a greater love, and the only way that you will fully experience it is if you experience him. And so there's many things that I could have talked about this morning, but these are some of the practical ways that we can begin to actually embody love, that we are people who value differences, that we are people who live vulnerably, but that we are people who say, when I love someone, I will love someone without a nexus strategy, knowing that this is what Jesus has done for me. So as I close, there's a couple things that I just want to challenge all of us with of what do I do with this? How do I do this? Where do I go? What's my next step? And here's the truth, there's not one application because there's many of us that are in here this morning. And so there's probably a different application for every single one of you, but I would say this, for some of you, here's your call. Your call is to actually be present so that you can be loved and be known, so that you can know and love others. Uh, Throughout churches in the United States, the average attendance for people is 1.7 times a month. 1.7 1.7 times a month people go to church, and that's considered regular attending. Uh, here at The Journey, what we found is the average attender goes twice a month. And, and I think that for some of you, your challenge is this. In order to experience this type of love, you actually have to be here. You actually have to show up. And to see that showing up is not just coming and going when I please, but to actually say, I want to be committed to a group of people. And as I commit to those group of people, I'm actually going to invite them into my life, and I'm going to actually enter into theirs. And I'll just say this very graciously, very humbly, very lovingly, but very honestly. If this is a church that you don't feel like you can commit to, that's okay. Because we believe that there's a lot of gospel-centered churches that are in this city. But what I would encourage you is go find a church that you can commit to if this isn't the one that you can. Go find a group of people because this isn't just about the journey. This is about what God wants to do with his followers in your life. But you've got to be present. You've got to allow people to enter into a relationship. Here's the second thing. 
Take a risk. So here's what's interesting, even as I stand up here. Uh, many of you sit in the same seats every single week, right? And what's interesting for me, probably for many of you, is uh, you know the people who sit around you. You might know their name. You certainly have shaken their hand or given them a high five from time to time. But my guess is it's never moved beyond that. You don't know how to pray for them. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know who they are beyond the surface. And the surface might be a really low bar here. It only might be their name. And I think taking a risk is saying, hey, I see these people every single week. And part of my risk is I'm going to actually invite them into my life to say, hey, let's go grab a meal. Let's go grab coffee. Why don't we get together outside of here so we can get to know each other? And I'll just tell you this. It will be awkward. It, it will be awkward. And, and it won't be the easiest thing. But you never know who God might want to bring into your life to help proclaim the excellencies of Jesus to you. But it requires taking a risk. It, it requires crossing that line to say, I actually want to know who you are. Here's the third thing, to find community. As I said to you already, community is not just when we gather on a weekend service. For some of you, it's, it's time to take a next step, and that might be membership, as Pastor John talked about earlier. For others of you, it might be a community group or a connect group or a Bible study. But to actually find consistent community rhythms in your life where you're in relationships with people. And if you don't know how to do that, if you don't know where to go, we have a welcome center in our lobby. We have information on our website. We have pastors and leaders that will be up here and in the back at the end of the service. We'd love to talk with you about how to do that. But to find community so that you can be in relationship with people who are different than you. And through those relationships that God can use them to help grow you. Fourth thing, if you're in community, to begin being vulnerable. To actually be somebody who moves beyond the surface to actually invite people in. That when your community group is going around and you're sharing prayer requests to move beyond circumstances to real vulnerability. For better or for worse, this is who I am, this is where I'm struggling, this is where I need help. That as I'm in community, I'm going to be open and I'm going to be needy. And if you don't have community right now, my prayer is that you find friendship in your life that you can actually in invite that type of vulnerability with. And the last thing is this, that we would be a people who would rest in Jesus. That we would be a people that before we say, I'm going to go do something, that we would actually rest in Jesus. Because, again, in order to embody love, you have to experience the love of Jesus. And here's the deal. Embodying love is not circumstantial. It's a calling. It's a calling. It's not, I'm only going to love you when the circumstances make sense. It's, I'm going to love you every single day of my life. Because this is what Jesus has done for me. And I will just tell you this right now. In order to do that... You actually have to daily understand your need for Jesus in the ways that he has unconditionally loved you so you can demonstrate that to other people. And here's what happens. When we become these people and when we begin to see this church is not just about me and what I can get out of it, but how God can use me to embody love to one another, then we become a place that proclaims the excellencies of Jesus. That we become a place to say that there's a greater hope and there's a greater love that extends beyond us. And as we start doing that, it allows us to be a people who live in relationship, who live love differently than any other person or any other thing in this world. And what it does at the end of the day is it elevates the name of Jesus. Because what we can be is we can say, look at these people who are different. Look at these people who are dysfunctional. Look at these people who are flawed. And yet look at these people who desperately need Jesus and proclaim his name and see their need for one another. That's what it means to embody love. That's what it means to be the people of God. That is what we are calling to you to as a church. Let's pray. So Father God, we come to you this morning very humbly recognizing that we are a people in need. Also recognizing that for many of us, we have a very low bar for relationships. And Lord, I just want to specifically pray and lift up those who are in this church who have been here for a while who feel alone or that feel unseen. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, show us and teach us how to be a people who see one another. Uh, Lord, that you would show us and teach us what it looks like to come alongside one another. I pray for those that are lonely right now, uh, Lord, that they would find community, but Lord, they would also see the ways that you've already loved them. Lord, I pray for those who have been wounded through community, wounded through relationships. Lord, I pray that you would use one another in this church to actually be a part of mending and healing wounds. And Lord, that as uh, we seek to heal through our relationships with one another, we would see the ways that you provide ultimate healing. And God, I pray that you would teach us what it means to embody love. Lord, that we would be a church, that we would be a people that see embodying love as a 
calling in our lives. And Lord, that we would see the ways in which you have loved us, that we would rest in your love for us, and Lord, that that would compel us to be people who seek to love one another. We love you, God. We thank you for your unconditional sacrificial love on our behalf. And Lord, we pray that we would live out of that, that we would rest in that, that we would find hope in that. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.